Welcome everyone, delighted to see so many of you today and welcome to our CEPR Safe seminar on the Wirecard scandal, what needs to change. Spoiler alert, quite a lot I'd imagine. Now my name's Tim Phillips from the CEPR and I'm going to be moderating today. I, I trust that you're all familiar with Wirecard accounting scandal by now. If you're not, we have got a great story to tell you over the next hour. Now what is going to be happening over the next hour? Well, after the scandal broke, the European Parliament's Committee on Economic and Monetary Affairs commissioned a, a paper on what should be done. And today we've got the paper's authors with us to talk about that. So I'm going to introduce them first of all, and then I'll let you know what the format is for today. So uh, first of all, uh, Jan Peter Kranen for Goethe University and the CPR. Jan, delighted to have you back. Give me a hello, Jan. Yeah, so I have to unmute myself also. Nice to be here. It's always, the, it's always the muting trap, yes. Good. Yeah, lovely to have you on board. And um, also from Goethe University, Katja Langenbuka. Katja, hello. Hi there. Now, Katja, you are our uh, legal expert for today. You're going to be specializing in that side of what we're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Great. Uh, also from Goethe University as well, Loriana Pellitzong. Uh, Loriana, hello. Nice to see you again. Hi, nice to see you again and good evening to everybody. And finally, uh, we like to be international on this and from the Chicago Booth School, uh, Christian Leutz. Christian, hello. Hi. Good, good to see everybody. Now, Christian's driving the slides today, so he has two responsibilities. Uh, what's going to happen? Well, uh, in a minute, uh, Christian's going to uh, introduce the, he's going to do the first presentation. And that's basically about what has happened and also a, a diagnosis of why that happened. Uh, now, after that, then uh, we might uh, take a couple of minutes for questions. Let's see what's coming in which is a good point for me to remind you, please do ask questions. Use the little Q&A tab that you've got uh, on your screen. And if you do click on that tab and you see a question that you particularly like and think is important, upvote it. You can vote it up. And so therefore the, the questions that most of you want to have answered will be at the top of the list when we look at it. And we'll try and get through all of your questions. Now, after Christian's been talking, um, we won't really have talked anything about, uh, said anything about what needs to be done. So that's going to be the second part of our presentation. And uh, the, all of our panel is going to be uh, going to be having a go at that. So Loriana is going to be looking into uh, the prescriptions for what should be done about uh, information flow. Christian's going to be back again for internal and external controls. Katya is going to be looking at uh, enforcement and supervision. And uh, Jan comes in at the end to steal all the glory looking at oversight at the European level. So it's a big agenda. Uh, after that, then with the time that we've got available, we'll take your questions. We'll try and get through as much as we can. We aim to go for about an hour. We'll stretch a little bit longer if there's a big backlog of questions, but we'll try not to outlast your stamina. There's plenty to be said about this, so I think I better hand over to Christian first of all. So Christian, can you please first of all introduce us to really you know, what happened and what we've learned from it? Okay, uh, <clears throat> thank you, Tim. Tim, I assume you everybody can see the, the slide share now? Are we good? Okay, well then thanks for the uh, opportunity to uh, uh, give this web seminar on our European uh, Parliament policy briefing. Uh, as Tim has already said, this was commissioned by the European Parliament as joint work with uh, Jan, Katja, and Loriana. And what we're doing in this briefing is we're, we're reviewing the, what <clears throat> happened in the, the Wirecard case, and then mostly talk about the potential implications. Our goal here is to generate some discussion, hopefully also some discussion with you, and to learn. Uh, we're not trying to point fingers, so most of our discussion is going to be forward uh, looking. Now, <clears throat> this is kind of a, um, Quick summary of the of recent events uh, of what ensued in the Wirecard case, and what really stands out about this case is sort of 
how long it took to came out or the slow unraveling of the case. There are indeed, were, or there were indeed prior allegations uh, already arising in, in 2015 and, and 16. What is important is that several of these allegations were about different issues and not always in the same place. Uh, so they popped up at various points, but it took until uh, 2020 when essentially it all unraveled. Uh, in June, also the auditor, uh, Ernst and Y, came out with a statement that Wirecard was a sophisticated fraud. I don't want to spend sort of a lot of time on these individual points because I'm sure you followed them in the press, but those are sort of the main uh, events that, that happened sort of in the year before its undoing. What I want to spend a little bit more time on is what are sort of the lessons? And here we're going to give you kind of a sneak preview, overview of what the themes are that run through our uh, report. And having reviewed the case and looked at the various institutions and players, what is interesting about Wirecard that it's not just the failure of, say, a particular player, say, the, the market supervisor, Boffin, has received a fair share of criticism in the public debate, but that actually many factors contributed. And as we put it, that all lines of defense against fraud have failed in one way or another. And so what are these lines of defense? What are the various players that we looked at? It's the internal controls in the company. It's the supervisory board. It's the external auditors, in this case, Ernst and Young. Uh, the financial reporting oversight, that is the, as it's called, the FREP um, or um, the DEP, uh, the, the DPR in, in German. Then there is the audit oversight. So this is the body that oversees the, uh, the, the audits, performs inspections. So this is the AOB in Germany. And then there's the market supervisor, Boffin. Now, what is important about cases like Wirecard, which are high profile, large uh, accounting scandals and, and fraud cases, is that they basically sent ripple effects through the financial system, through the capital markets. They have, as economists call it, negative externalities. And it's these externalities are why we, we care about them, because they essentially destroy trust in capital markets. And trust is a, is a very important public good. Because when there is less trust or no trust in the capital markets, then basically investors respond by increasing the risk premium, which means for firms that their cost of capital is going up. And also investors are less willing to participate. So if we want deep liquid capital markets, widespread participation by investors, then these fraud cases are essentially a neg have a negative effect on that. And that's why they're problematic. And then a final sort of point that we make that is very important to us is that these ripple effects are not contained or confined to a single country. They basically, uh, especially when you're trying to have a single capital market in Europe, they will send ripple effects to other countries as well, and which is why in the report, we also discuss what some of the European implications are of a scandal of this magnitude. So to us, the Wirecard scandal revealed major weaknesses in the market and institutional oversight system. And again, it's not just you know, a single player or just the supervision. It is the various other players as well. We acknowledge that there's even other factors beyond sort of the institutions, like the in integrity and the individual failings uh, of, of people, but that's not something that we look much uh, at in our uh, report or briefing. We focus on the deficiencies that policymakers in principle can, um, can fix. Uh, and so we focus on the institutions. And looking at, at those institutions, in our mind, it isn't that there is a sort of a single key piece in the system that we were missing that we could point to, but that the pieces in the system were not working well and, and not working well together. So the overarching sort of message of our report and, and, and uh, recommendations is that we need to ensure investor protection and market integrity. This is critical 
for a well-functioning uh, capital market, the market needs a well-functioning oversight system. Now, we want to point out that the goal cannot be to prevent each and every fraud in the future. This would clearly be overly costly and, 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 and cannot be the goal. But again, it is important for markets that they have a well-functioning oversight system so that they can make their valuable contributions um, that, that markets and, and capital markets provide. And so to do that, out the themes that we emphasize is to strengthen accountability of the individual uh, players in the system, rather than creating a lot of new rules, which often is sort of the knee-jerk reaction to uh, corporate scandals. So what we mean by strengthening accountability for the various players, we have in mind the board, the auditors, the oversight bodies, and the market supervisor. The other major theme of the report is that accurate information is key for capital markets to function well. So this obviously applies to the financial reporting or the audited financial reports, which featured very prominently in the Wirecard debate, but it also applies to players such as the short sellers um, and the whistleblowers that may bring negative information in cases such as these relatively early on and this is something where we also felt that the system was not functioning as well as it, it probably should. And so that's another um, aspect that we, we look at. So to foreshadow the discussion, and, and then I will stop and we'll take some a first round of questions, is we have basically reform suggestions in four different areas. We have the information flow. So this is where we're, we, we looked at the short sell ban that was instituted by Boffin. Um, and uh, the role of whistleblowers, which there were some in the um, Wirecard case as well. Then we look at the auditors and the internal controls. As I said, those are you know kind of the first lines of defense. We look at the enforcement for financial reporting through the FREP and um, its mandate, as well as the supervisor, that is Boffin, and then look at the European implications uh, at the very end. So with that, let me actually stop it here and take the slides down and uh, take turn it over back to Tim so that we can do a first round of questions. Yes, please. And if anyone does have some questions, do do ask them. But I have a question question for you, Christian. I've uh, I was looking at the report and I was looking at what happened. And um, as a journalist, I've reported on financial frauds before, and I'm thinking this looks familiar. A lot of these things have cropped up in other frauds. This is a particularly large and a particularly dramatic one. How much of this is just typical of financial fraud as it tends to happen? So I think, you know, I teach um, accounting and, and, and financial reporting. And one of the, the themes that or, or topics that we cover are various fraud cases and I, I teach in the US. And so we, I talk with my students about Enron and a number of, of other um, scandals. And I am too sort of struck by the similarities that you can see between uh, or, or, or across these different uh, the fraud cases. I think there's often, you know, uh, a, a, a star, a rising star in the market. There's something new about the technology that runs through a lot of these, these cases, which makes it very difficult also for um, the oversight bodies and, and the supervisors to know when to step in because they obviously don't want to take down sort of a rising star when there really is, isn't anything to it. Um, I think it often has a lot to do also, you see that they're often uh, uh, captivating individuals, if you, if you say, when you look at some of these fraud cases, and then you do see that there is, that institutions matter. Um, and in the U.S., as I, I uh, uh, mentioned Enron, the U.S. also reformed its system and institutions uh, quite substantially after the Enron, Welcome and Tyco scandals. And so you'll see that some of our suggestions are in line with uh, reactions we've seen in other countries. Yeah, and those are exactly the scandals I, w I was thinking of. Um, I just to give you, uh, can I uh, put a couple of the questions here? Because they're quite interesting ones. Uh, 
Uh, Bernard Casey asks, is Germany worse at managing um, these accountable systems than other EU countries or the UK or the US? Are we saying at this point that Germany had a particularly bad structure or that everybody's structure is bad and Germany is typical of it? Do, do one of my German... The people who sit in Germany want to take that question, Jan. That sounds like it's potentially sounds like it might be one for you, Jan. Yes. Yeah, I mean, this is a point we will get at, but I, I think that Germany is special, but not really structurally different from other European capital markets that have a certain, let's say, they are catching up with with uh, uh, other countries' capital markets, and there are developments that have to be made. I mean, the Wirecard case is a situation where you can think about your institutional setup you can consider it and if we speak here about the wider implications it's really not so much tracing the very person who made a mistake and that date but rather in general how do the institutions seem to work what does this case signal about the capacity of our institutional architecture to deal with market integrity and investor protection as Christian said, and how can we improve on that? And that is true for, I would say, across Europe in all major uh, countries. Yes, and uh, just one more before we get on to the second part. Can, Everybody, can just, yep, yeah, sure, of course, Ken. Yes. Yeah, I just want to jump in with one, you know, given that your question was also, is Germany sort of particularly bad? And I agree with everything that Jan said. But again, sort of from, an, you know, having been in the US for a longer time, sort of more of an outside view, it does strike me as that what, and this is not a German specific point, but more sort of one for Europe, is that embracing markets and some of the positive forces that could come from markets is actually something that I think Europe uh, should think about. And that's something that we see a bit more in, in, in the US. So the, the, I would say you see this a little bit when you, when you look at how, say, the, the Financial Times where the short sellers were uh, treated relative to the, say, the corporate players. I think you see a little bit that there is sort of this attitude towards markets that uh, is perhaps different in Europe than it would be in the US. Yes, very interesting. I hope we'll we'll get into that as well. I just can I put just one more to you before we move on to the specific remedies and all the other questions. You know, we're not throwing away your questions we're keeping them just maybe for later um but there there is a question um thomas balls uh, saying that the the report you know it's within the context of a political ideological system and it doesn't get into that is a certain amount of accounting scandal inevitable um because of the long-term drift towards uh, how can I put it, light touch regulation and free markets. Do we have to accept a certain amount of scandal like this? So I would say that we should take a relatively hard line on fraud and fraud cases because of the externalities and the ripple effects that they send through markets. Again, I don't think the goal can be to stamp out each and every fraud and we will never achieve that and the cost of that would be clearly too high. But I do think that um, you, you can't have a functioning oversight system without sort of, um, you know, making it, it, it in a way sort of, I don't think we should make it too easy is what I'm saying. I think it will be important to have the system, but in part, because we are also concerned about the other side, you know, with every regulation, there's costs that, that uh, are, you know, cared by the firms or by the, also by investors. We do think that the, the reaction here should be to rethink how we can make the players function better which is why we emphasize the accountability rather than saying we just need a bunch of new rules and a lot of new additional hurdles uh, for this to uh, uh, work better in the future. I think it's better to say we, we probably have a, a reasonable rule set, but how can we rejiggle this so that it works better in the future and the likelihood of major scandals like these arising is substantially reduced. Yeah, can I, can I just jump in, Tim? So, so I think this is a very important what Christian said, and that's almost like an umbrella about what we say. We don't say more regulation. 
we say better regulation. And that's a, a more effective regulation, right? And the, the institutional setup must be basically helping the ideas of the regulation to, to become true. And we identify several issues where this couldn't happen and didn't happen, and that can be basically changed. And that's what we will now talk about. Great. Well, yes, let's get on to that uh, rejiggling. Just to, to close this on, I do have to note when I was looking back over the timeline in addition for it, only about a month before the whole scandal broke in the, in the middle of this year, there were 10 analysts that still rated Wirecard as a buy. So institutional note there. Um, OK, so uh, let's move on to remedies. And uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to invite Loriana, you're going to uh, talk to us about how we can improve information flow, aren't you? Yeah. So thank you very much. And uh, just to add on what it has just said, uh, I would like to stress that uh, what we want to provide is an idea on how, in some sense, to improve regulation in order to intervene earlier. Right? You know, you cannot avoid fraud, as it has been stre stressed already several times, but we need to have a system that intervenes on time as soon as possible and not after years. That's the key point that we think it should be stressed. And, you know, uh, as it has been uh, already um, described, there was in some sense a sort of information flow that it has been stopped. So it has been prevented to be effective and to uh, signal the right warning to the right people. So on one side, I, I'm sure that most of you know that there were people uh, that in some sense sent signals that something were not working. They sent signals to different type of player in this, uh, uh, let's say, uh, in the system, to the firm itself. So there were people inside the firm that provide this type of information that something was not working well. There were people that provide information to the auditor that as well something was not working well. And there were also outside people that provide information outside to newspaper. And the newspaper actually, you know, do write and provide signal that there was something not clear, something not working in this uh, um, in, in this company. However, all this type of information that came out under different dimension from what we call, you know, the wisely blowing uh, or the wisely blowers, pretty much, it has not either listened properly or, uh, you know, try even, th there was some attempt to stop this type of information coming out. And uh, clearly this is already giving us uh, the, as a suggestion that instead this type of information flow shouldn't be stopped, but actually incentivized. So we are suggesting that maybe we should think to provide financial incentives to people that help to discover fraud early, uh, as soon as possible. And uh, clearly, you know, this is giving the incentive on one side to provide uh, warning and on the other side, you know, to listen to this type of warning. So this is one um, one way. Of course, there are a lot of information coming that may be wrong or are just, you know, trying to create noise. So we need clearly to have a, a significant framework to screen this type of information. But for sure, we shouldn't, you know, avoid to check and screen this, uh, this flow. So this is one part. The second part is coming from the market. You, you know, the, the price of a stock is providing per se a lot of information to uh, market participant. And uh, under this framework, short sellers are playing an important role because they are really the one with, uh, that are clearly benefiting in uh, having the price reflecting the information, the, the negative information they have about a single stock. So clearly, on one side, you know, the price of a stock is reflecting this type of information and the uh, short seller do have the incentive to trade in a way that at the end their private information has been revealed in the price. Uh, from this perspective, short selling banks is preventing this flow of information. Clearly, uh, you know, it could be that short, short sellers are not 
clearly well informed. But then, you know, if this is not the case, if this is not the case that they, they are having information about the fundamental value of the firm, then we lose money by doing short selling. So on one side, uh, we know that from the regulatory point of view, short selling banks are justified only when there is a significant risk in creating, let's say, at the market level, systemic risk. So uh, in the case of the wild card, uh, it seems that you know, the regulators uh, intervene or better the supervisor intervene from this that using the short selling banks, uh, not really you know, uh, providing a significant assessment of the level of systemic risk that really the wild card uh, stock um, and the short selling on this stock may have created in terms of systemic risk of the market. And uh, on this side, you know, clearly they have prevented information to flows. On the other side, they have also given a, a signal to the market because some of the investors seeing the, the supervisor intervening may get the impression that the supervisor were having some information that the market were not having in regarding the goodness of the firm, regarding the value of the firm. So this means that, you know, short selling banks is such a, a, a delicate instrument that cannot be used so often. And it has been in some sense uh, um, uh, use only in very extreme cases uh, in order to, uh, you know, to prevent, as, as, as it is from the regulatory point of view, systemic risk, contagion, you know, very bad and perverse effect. And uh, uh, this means that it has to be used and, uh, uh, in a very restrictive way. That's why, you know, we are suggesting, and this is the second suggestion we are providing, that it has to be pretty much a reverse burden of proof by the supervisor. And it has to be really used more uh, in terms of, you know, uh, try to catch, uh, we need really to try to catch more fraud rather than, you know, trying to... Uh, uh, say that uh, there is uh, some systemic perverse effect uh, due to short selling. And, uh, uh, and this is also, you know, in line with what uh, uh, Christian just said, that uh, it seems that there is a bias. We want to penalize, let's say, a short seller and investor from this point of view, so the market view, rather than, uh, uh, you know, uh, taking the case that maybe managers are making a fraud, so firms are on the wrong side in this case. So it seems that sometimes these uh, short selling banks has been used just to penalize the market without, you know, uh, looking in details on where really the issue is. But clearly, ex post is easy to say, but even ex ante, we think it should be uh, a little bit more difficult to impose this type of short ban. Thank you very much. Thanks. Christian, uh, for you now on uh, internal and external controls. Yes. Uh, so in this part, we look at uh, private institutions um, that uh, exercise oversight. So these are the internal auditors, supervisory board, uh, the external auditors, but also outside investors. And as I've mentioned before, the first two lines of defense uh, or oversight elements are really the internal controls and the auditors because of their privileged access to information, right? So they have information inside the company. And uh, in that sense, they come much earlier than the market uh, supervisors or other external sort of oversight bodies. Now, um, if you look at how we've talked briefly about Enron and other uh, U.S. scandals, if you look at how the U.S., uh, you know, what the U.S. did after uh, these scandals, they also targeted these two elements. So Sarbanes-Oxley is essentially about internal controls and public audit oversight. And so our uh, recommendations here are in, in a, a similar spirit or have, have at least some, some similarities. And as Tim has already pointed out, the Wyatt card case to us really isn't a special case. And in fact, we think that there's a common refrain to these high profile accounting manipulations and fraud cases that go undetected for a long time, but are, you know, have clean audit opinions uh, issued for them in for their financial statements. 
Now, we acknowledge that detecting fraud is clearly very difficult. And um, as we've already sort of briefly mentioned, or Loriana said as well, there's often hindsight bias, right? And there's sort of a desire to, to blame somebody after the, the scandal uh, comes out and the auditor is often, you know, uh, the, the last man standing, so to speak. And so in that sense, we, we recognize the difficulties, but at the same time, it's also the case that auditors rarely assume responsibility in these cases. And so what we think this Wirecard case um, should provide is, is sort of a, 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 a starting point for a discussion about external audits. And this is a discussion that should be had, not just in Germany, but also in, uh, in other European countries. And in fact, the UK has had has similar discussions underway as a result of, of uh, several scandals uh, that they have seen. And so what we mean by this change of focus is, for instance, making it unmistakably clear in the law, not just the professional standards that already talk about this, that reasonable checks to uncover accounting manip manipulations are an integral part of the audits to sort of uh, clarify and, and clearly state the accountability, which is sort of the over, again, the overarching theme of, of what we have in mind. With that also comes an increase in auditor uh, liability that we think the liability limits in, in Germany are quite low. And there's quite a few other people that have made similar uh, suggestions in, in this regard. And then uh, there's one other element of the oversight system that has received less attention in the public debate, but we think should be reviewed and we should look into the effectiveness of the audit oversight body. So this in Germany is the, uh, the AOB. Um, <clears throat> you know, much of the discussion was about FREP and, and BaFin, but in terms of accountability for the auditors, the oversight body plays, the audit oversight body plays a significant role. And one concrete suggestion we have here is that these oversight bodies conduct independent or they conduct inspections of the engagements and the auditors, but we know very little about the outcome of these inspections. And so one of the things that, that could change is that the audit oversight body basically provides um, the, some information about the, the findings of these inspections at the level of the audit firm. So not engagement level, but audit firm level, which is something that we, we also see in the US because that provides useful information to both clients and markets. And then on the internal controls side and the supervisory boards that first of all have the primary responsibility for um, you know, the, the, the company, uh, we think that it should be mandated that firms have an effective internal control system. Many do, but it's not you know, necessarily required. And it seems like in the Wirecard case, that system was clearly lacking or, or uh, not working the way it, it should be. And in this regard, I think one can debate, this is not where, where we've not come out with a clear recommendation, but we said the pros and cons should be considered is whether this internal control system should actually be audited. If it were audited, I think it would further clarify the auditor's responsibility and, and, and uh, in terms of looking into doing reasonable checks to uncover accounting manipulations because the internal control system in that regard is really uh, critical. And then um, in terms of the supervisory boards, we feel like in Germany, there are already extensive responsibilities as well as corresponding liabilities to the super or for the supervisory board. And so in that sense, I don't think this is a place where we don't need necessarily new rules, but the part that is very important is that the supervisory board has direct access and has the right information that they can basically exercise uh, their oversight. And for this, one of the suggestions for us is to provide direct access to information without management's interference is to consider having the head of compliance or internal controls report to uh, the supervisory board, which is something that uh, we, for instance, see in, uh, in Switzerland, uh, uh, where the, the internal controls is recommended by the corporate governance code to report to the Verwaltungsrat. And then lastly, that the uh, supervisory board should have a dedicated audit committee 
where the chair of the audit committee is separate from the chair of the supervisory board is independent and a financial expert, as well as the majority of the members of this audit committee should, um, should also be independent. Again, there are many companies that already have these uh, audit committees, but for listed companies, this, uh, this should be uh, required. With that, let me uh, turn it over to Katya. Yes, indeed, Katya, thank you. You're uh, up you, now for you on uh, supervision. Right. So um, one of the things we realized when we were drafting this report is that culture plays a large role in understanding these issues. And, you know, if we compare um, the pretty much um, bank centered European continent to the much more capital market centered um, US American and uh, probably also UK culture, um, a lot of things pop up which make us understand where certain traditions and certain behavior stems from. And that's true for both of our recommendations. Um, for the focus on financial reporting more specifically, and uh, for the more general point we wanted to make as to an overarching market mandate. So as to financial reporting, um, it's interesting that uh, we felt it's one thing which uh, European countries quickly understood that capital markets in order to be efficient need good disclosure. Um, and so the, the prospectus regulation regime, the market abuse regime, insider trading, et cetera, that's something which has been connected to the functioning of capital markets. However, as to financial reporting, um, this seems to be less the case, so to speak. And so uh, turning to Buffin um, as a competent authority for enforcing financial reporting, um, that might make us understand this link to culture that all the confidentiality rules and the feeling that numbers need to be kept secret might have a background in this culture of um, kind of uh, divorcing financing needs from disclosure needs. So one of our recommendations was to say, well, the system of having Frapp and Boffin sort of at the same time in charge, and unfortunately, even Frapp kind of being the first mover, blocking out Boffin's competencies, we said this is nothing which seems to be a good um, institutional architecture. So um, we, we recommend to make Boffin the only competent authority, um, allocate powers as well as accountability with Boffin. And um, of course, FREP is you know, important in the sense that it brings um, a certain outlook, a certain um, knowledge as to market practices. And in that way, it's able to help um, a supervisory agency, which is after all an administrative body. So FREP will be uh, greatly valued in terms of um, helping Buffin along, you know, sending staff and helping with investigations. But we, we recommend to not leave um, powers um, to start an investigation with FREP in any way. Um, and that leads on to, to the next suggestion we made, which said we, we will probably need more investigative and enforcement powers. Again, if you um, compare the system to the SEC, for example, so um, the SEC also has kind of two different ways of going forward, sort of a, a starting um, pre-formal investigation working with cooperation, and then only after they decide to go forward with a real investigation, um, we get powers, but then we get them, right? And then you can issue subpoenas and whatnot. Whereas um, under the German system for now, interestingly enough, there's quite a number of powers um, as to market abuse and insider trading and more, um, but there's pretty few powers for Buffen um, in terms of investigation and enforcement as to financial reporting. And so we felt financial reporting being um, as crucial probably um, as market abuse, we need to step up those powers. And then lastly, um, one of our recommendations is to say, with this cultural point in mind, we need someone to be kind of the guy to turn to. And so Buffin needs to have some 
some overall accountability. If something's going wrong on the market, we want to turn to Buffett. And remember that Germany doesn't follow what we call a twin peak structure as to oversight. So Buffett has a number of hats on, so to speak. Buffett is at the same time a banking supervisory authority. It's looking after market abuse, etc. And it's also looking after financial reporting in the sense just outlined. And so if you have a, a kind of super body such as Buffin, it needs to be the accountable one. So um, that, that's the sense of our suggestion to say we need full accountability and full powers for both investor protection and market integrity. And lastly, um, we also, again, drawing a comparison to the US and the SEC with political independence um, and sufficient resources to make Buffin kind of stand on its own feet. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And finally, uh, looking at the European level, Jan, there's been some interest in it in, is in the questions already. How do you see oversight being improved at the European level? Yeah, thank you, Tim. So uh, most of what we said, or almost all of what we said so far is really related to the the particular situation that we find in Europe, in, in Germany, sorry, the institutional structure, the way institutions behave, maybe even the cultural aspect that Katja just mentioned. But it is also clear from what we have been studying that these situations may look a bit different in other European countries. And so there is a fragmentation in the way the supervisory process is applied as a company, whether you are listed here or there, may have implications of, on the way you are supervised. So that is not integrated. And don't forget that we are aiming for a European capital market. Uh, we have this capital market union project and there is the idea for global investors one day to see one European capital market that uses similar rules, not only on the rule level, but also on the enforcement level, also on the implementation level. And that is clearly not the case at the moment. Uh, and that is um, uh, one of the major reasons why we recommend to consider, apart from remedy, remedying uh, the situation in Germany itself, also to a, on a broader scale, to look at Europe at large and try to, let's say, structure or design um, a supervisory architecture for Europe that takes into consideration the experiences we have been making in the Wirecard case and which in a way are symptomatic of a system that has local authorities, local cultures, local practices and um, that is certainly uh, only the first level of how much integration you can, you can in the end um, achieve. Uh, we have more arguments for having a European single capital market supervisor as an institution with enforcement power and with the clearly formulated mandate that Katja just mentioned. Uh, and I just mentioned them without going into the details. There are certain national biases how in crisis situations, how in critical situations, cases are interpreted. Uh, and it has a lot to do with what is uh, basically the company in, in question that you are dealing with. Is it a national hopeful or, or not? Right? And uh, so uh, there may be interpretations that have to, that where basically certain interests um, of the regulator may interfere with other interests that are um, um, also included in, in the way um, supervision is executed. Uh, there may be spillover effects from one country to the other because for people far away from the regulatory practice, you may conclude from observing a weakness in one country that similar weaknesses may exist in other places. And so you have this externality that Christian mentioned at the very beginning of, of our presentation. So for all that, we think it's time to think about this strong European a mandated European supervisor. And uh, of course, the question arises, what happens to the network of national supervisory agencies that we have nowadays? So we think they can be very well integrated in a hub and spoke type of system. 
uh, in, in, in Europe at large, where the national authorities, with all their knowledge about companies and practices and culture on the local level, play a very important role as part of the system. What we point out is, if you would think about such a hub and spoke architecture, it should be clear that the reporting line of the national uh, supervisory agencies goes to the hub and not to the national finance ministries or other national bodies with definitely additional interests besides the, um, the investor protection and market integrity. And final point, uh, one may quite naturally, if you talk about this European supervisor, think of ESMA, an institution that sits in Paris, is basically ready to play such a major role. But we want to stress that this ESMA may be a candidate for that, but not necessarily is this the case. One should think about how to design such a hub institution properly um, and, uh, and then the result may be that ESMA is the right one, but it may also be that another institution will be uh, created that performs that task a bit in parallel to what we see in banking, where we have the European Banking Authority uh, besides the uh, single supervisory me mechanism. So there are also um, uh, role models in, in other fields. So we don't take a stand on that. We just say, uh, look and make, uh, make further thoughts on this. Um, let me conclude on this one uh, argument that um, uh, already Katja mentioned. I think the whole problem that we have been observing in the case of Wirecard is a certain, let's say, uh, distance in thinking and acting vis-a-vis uh, -vis markets and their uh, requirements and their behavior. Uh, we hope that with a unified supervisory architecture, you also be develop a, so a sort of human capital uh, at a hub that can help to create this a more open culture to markets. So I mean that on the hub side, you would also induce um, a different type of reporting, a different type of research, a different type of data collection, and also a different type of perception from the outside that see Europe as a unified uh, a capital market in the end. So thank you. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, can I stay with you, actually, Jan, seeing as, yes. uh, seeing, seeing as you're up at the minute? There is one of the popular questions is from uh, Jean-Louis Gigou, who says, uh, who points out that uh, Wirecard was not under Baffin's supervisory remit, only the subsidiary that had the bank license. So therefore, considering the uh, who should supervise listed companies that are non banks now, he sort of points out BMW, for example. Is this going beyond the remit of what we ought to be discussing at the moment and stick to banks? Or is this a discussion that we really ought to be having? No, I mean, I have to thank you for picking that question because it points at a perception that is widely shared among observers, namely thinking Bafin is a banking supervisor, and that's how we know Bafin. And so it only looks at the banking part of an institution. Actually, that is true in the case of Wirecard. It's a, almost an inner cultural problem. But in fact, and by law, Buffin is also the supervisor of all listed firms. Of course, in a difference, it's supervising the integrity of the market. It's supervising the protection of investors. Both are at stake and have been at stake at Wirecard. So it's a clear um, example where Bafin in its other role should have been very, very active. I mean, it was active to a certain extent and that was our study. They, of course, couldn't do it because they had this institutional design which was in a way dysfunctional with FREP taking all the, the action uh, and, and so far. So uh, the, the perception outside is often Bafin is banking, but that is not true. Okay. Uh, uh, interesting. I didn't know. Um, okay. Christian, can I come to you? Because there are many questions about the role of uh, auditors, what that role should be, 
and what we should do to the structure of the market for audits. Uh, I suppose the, the first question that several people have mentioned is, well, you know, if you want your audit done, there are four people to do it. So there isn't really competition in the market. And they've sort of decided what the remit of an audit is. Uh, is there anything that we should do to incentivize competition? Um, yeah, so I saw some of these questions in, in the Q&A box, and I think the concentration of the audit market is something that keeps popping up over and over and is, is something that is, is clearly um, makes all kinds of reforms more difficult. So if you think about rotation, for instance, if you have only four players, some of them may actually be auditing a competitor, then uh, it becomes very difficult to sort of, even the rotation might not uh, do a whole lot. So the part that I want to say first, or the uh, or an important aspect is that the concentration in the audit market is in part driven by the nature of this market, right? It has a lot to do with the globalization and the scale of firms. You need basically audit firms that can audit firms that are in different locations that are quite large and that to some extent match the scale of the, the firms. And also from a reputation point of view, you would expect that in a, in a credence good market where, the, where somebody's putting reputation on the line, size matters, reputation capital matters. And so in that regard, a lot of the, the, the concentration that we see is basically something that arises endogenously automatically in, in the audit market, which makes it so difficult to, um, to handle. So one suggestion or, or, or idea we have in the, um, in, in the paper that we sort of uh, briefly mentioned, and it's worth maybe discussing here, is that we could consider, for instance, that uh, other audit firms provide a second opinion, not a, a full audit, and that that second opinion might come from a non-big uh, four auditor. Now, the idea behind this and reason why we sort of threw this out as an idea would be to say, well, maybe over time, so this second opinion would more focus on the audit process and, and the audit papers, so it's much smaller in scale and maybe something that a, a, a larger second tier auditor could could provide, and then that 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 over time perhaps builds up uh, the uh, the uh, the sort of the other auditors, and as a result of that, we maybe end up back with you know um, more large players than we currently have. But to be completely honest, I think the the the, the concentration issue is one where we don't. I think there isn't a sort of a clear or obvious solution because it arises from the market forces and and has a lot to do with the firms that are being audited. Yes. Do you think that uh, that um, that would it would be possible at all to do that just simply because anyone who's sort of marketing an auditor's homework is not going to get the same access to information that the auditor does? We do have dual audits in France, and we could study, you know, what we've learned from from those. Um, uh, and and this is why we did, didn't make this sort of a recommendation at the end, because I, we do think this deserves further discussion. As you point out, I think there are difficulties in implementing this, and and would some of the uh, smaller audit firms really be able to do this? But um, I. You know, it, the 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 other question that was in the in the chat also was about what happens if the next audit firm were to go, um, you know, bust. Would that you know we would be left with three? Would we uh, let that happen? You know, in the same way Arthur Anderson was going under after the um, the scandals in the U.S. And I think it it poses clearly this question. Of, of what do we do about the concentration uh, in, in the audit markets that we see. But I don't think we have, I, I at least don't have an obvious answer for this question. Yes, okay, yeah, and uh, this is a question that's been asked many times in many places after these similar scandals, hasn't it? Uh, let's have a look, Katia. Um, uh, I was uh, interested in, in what you said about FREP. There have been calls to just abolish rep and not have uh, and just do away with it i was quite surprised to find out that i think frep has 15 employees and you seem to be describing a role for it that would be very much a beefed up frep 
would be the ideal, yes. Um, so, so maybe a bit on a background on FREP. So there, there used to be no FREP, evidently. And after Enron, which has been mentioned a couple of times, and uh, the Sarbanes-Oxley Act in Germany, we started reforming the whole structure as well. Um, and so FREP um, isn't even, hadn't even been in the law, let's say, earlier on. Um, and the idea of having a FREP was introduced in order to get kind of private knowledge into the supervisory architecture. And so this idea in general is a good idea, right? It's never wrong, so to speak, to introduce um, private knowledge. And it was modeled after the UK structure, um, which has a lot private in, in private hands. Um, now, the problem with it is, as I said before, that the, the the balance of powers, so to speak, is an odd balance if we have a public authority having less competencies than a private body. Um, does that mean that we should abolish it at all? No, um, it just means that it can't have any, any powers of enforcement or um, you know, its own powers of investigation. It needs to be a helper. Um, but as a helper, I think it fulfills a valuable role as long as it's only delivering um, knowledge rather than uh, taking its own decisions. Okay. And uh, um, Loriana, I've got one for you as well about whistleblowers here from Giancarlo. He's saying that uh, uh, this is, I, and I'm reading, I, I'll read it directly what he says. German institutions have systematically bashed whistleblowers and supported loyalty to company that have committed crimes for decades. Now, the, I mean, I think the, the, the bigger question is, uh, you're talking about um, increasing incentives for whistleblowers. Well, we had very credible whistleblowers and a lot of them over a period of years in Wirecard. It's just that nobody took any notice of them. Is what you're saying for whistleblowers really going to move the needle? Yeah, so, you know, uh, it is true that uh, in this case, uh, as I already said, you know, most of them has not been listened uh, at all, or some of them has been also suited. So that's, uh, that's also something that we need to recognize. Uh, but uh, uh, the, the problem is that, uh, uh, you know, um, on one side, it is difficult to screen who are the one really providing right information, who are the one that are not. Uh, but overall, this issue about culture is also a big problem, you know, on the fact that uh, I'm listening more if I have people telling bad, bad things about uh, let's say, trader, short seller, and so on, rather than uh, if I have someone that maybe creates some issue or some doubt about the goodness of a champions, like, you know, Wildcard was a thing that I want to remember that it was, you know, pretty much one of the uh, unicorn, let's say, company in, in Germany. So clearly... Um, there is this type of bias that uh, in uh, uh, in the system combined with all the other elements that we, in some sense, uh, uh, described, uh, were in some sense pushing on this other direction rather than listening properly on uh, on this, uh, let's say, uh, suggestion that these people were trying to provide or information they were trying to provide. And mm. I, I, can I clarify something that you said in this? Is do we have to? get over the idea that in some way the short sellers are the bad guys, which is something that's often uh, that, that's often talked about, and that short sellers are in, in some ways kind of whistleblowing themselves. Correctly. And in fact, if you're looking to all the academic studies that has been done on short selling bonds, what they actually show is that, you know, it is, it, you know, this type of bonds were indeed preventing in some sense the price to reflect the right information. So, uh, so it seems that uh, uh, it is, you know, such short sellers are playing an important role in the market. Uh, and it is exactly the fact that, uh, you know, they are helping information to be included in the price and, you know, inform the other investor about something going on on this firm. Uh, 
uh, it shouldn't be looked to them uh, as a negative thing. You know, there is this idea that they are doing market manipulation. That's something that, you know, I didn't stress before, but maybe we need to stress now. Uh, but if they are really able to, first of all, it's very difficult to do market manipulation because, you know, they're not the only trader in the market. There are a lot of others. And, uh, uh, and it is also difficult to identify market manipulation uh, on the other side. So, but before to impose short selling, uh, the regulation is very clear. It's not imposing short selling because there is market manipulation. Market manipulation has been, in some sense, investigated, and there will be some law, some you know, judge that will then uh, uh, do its job if indeed there was market manipulation proof later on. So, uh, short selling ban has to be uh, adopted only if there is the, the, the risk of systemic risk. And this has to be very clear. And instead, you know, so the question is if indeed at the time when we observe this short selling ban, indeed there was the evidence of presence of risk for systemic risk or, you know, very huge contagion around, uh, on, the, uh, on the German stock market. Uh, Christian, can I um, talk to you the couple of questions about the supervisory board here? Uh, Axel saying, um, you know, the supervisory board has access to all the information it needs at the moment. Hans Dieter pointing out that isn't part of the problem the uh, small size, lack of diversity in supervisory boards. Is there anything we can do to mandate reform of what the of the composition of the supervisory board and the role that it takes for itself? Yeah, it's a it's a, a great question. I think the we we debated this quite a bit when we were um, <clears throat> writing the report. I the the composition mandating or, or sort of prescribing the composition is obviously quite difficult, right? Because how, how you exactly you sort of describe the characteristics of, of the board. I think the independence is clearly one that uh, is important so that the, the supervisory board directly, uh, that the supervisory board sort of exercises true oversight. And this is where we, where we feel like on the audit side, you can make a uh, I think it seems pretty obvious that the the supervisory board should have an audit committee, and that the audit committee members um, should, you know, there should at least uh, some financial experts on that audit committee, and we need uh, some independent uh, members of that um, of that audit committee. So th those are the ones that um, we have pointed out. Now, if you look at the corporate governance uh, code for Germany, I think independence is something that is being stressed. Uh, and so I think that is something that we, I think people or companies should take a hard look at. But in terms of explicit recommendations, we focus mainly on the super uh, on the on the audit committee and the supervisory board, which um, you know is not something that is required, but many companies do have. Okay. Now uh, we're getting to the time when we really need to uh, to wrap this up, but I want to put a question to all of you, which is a pretty general question. Actually, it's a broad one. You can take it where you want. And that's um, Andrew was talking uh, was asking uh, how contingent is the success of any re reform on all five lines of defence that you've outlined being implemented, or you know just one or two? Would that get a subway down the line? Um, I'd like to add to that as well. What do you actually think is going to happen? Because we all know we have been here before and clearly whatever has been put in place over the years is not sufficient at the moment. This is an example of that. So really, is it going to be hand wringing plus some small tinkering or do you actually think we'll get into it this time? Who will I start with? Well, shall I go in order and start with Loriana? Well, you know, my impression is that uh, we need to wait long before we are going really to, to change our mind on the role that short sellers are playing in the market. And in fact, you know, uh, if you're looking to the documents that are coming out now from regulators, you know, on how they have, uh, they are looking, even the ESMA document that is doing the peer review, the part related to the short sell to the regarding to the short selling ban, it seems just uh, uh, 
then between buffing and FRAP. So, you know, I think that we need to wait before that we will reach, uh, let's say, the result that, uh, you know, uh, people that you know, whistleblower will be listened and short selling will be allowed to do their job. Okay, that's uh, Christian. What about you? What do you think? Uh, how how much and um, what will happen? Yeah, so I mean, if you look at some of the the uh, reform proposals that are already out, you know, the <clears throat> there's the the uh, the Fisk or uh, proposal that the German government has put out. It looks like qu- quite a few of the things that we're talking about are in the making or being discussed. But to your more to your question, which was specifically about sort of how do we think about the various elements? And the question was about, you know, is it sufficient to tweak one or two? And I think the system perspective is pretty important. And I want to draw an analogy here is I think what should be built more into the system is sort of an expectation that certain elements at times might fail because fraud is difficult to detect. It's a very, you know, there were some fairly sophisticated techniques at place. Uh, at play. And so I think this perspective to say, okay, think about an airplane, right? With an airplane, we also expect that individual parts fail. And then we say, what do we have as backup if this element fails? And I think it's that type of a perspective to that we need to have here so that we think about how these systems interact and how one system is the backup for another, if, 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 if one element gets uh, circumvented or, um, or fails. And it related to that, I think to give you one of these interactions in the system. So one reason why we thought liability, increasing liabilities for the auditor is a good idea. And we're not saying this should be unlimited. The auditor cannot be the residual claimant. But if we have higher limits, then that could also make it easier or incentivizes people to perhaps bring some of these cases to court. That will bring the courts in, in a more principled matter in, this, in a way that the courts will also then ask and, and, and provide opinions and precedent on what the responsibilities of the audit are. This is a very difficult subject. And so if we have more, a, a bit more litigation that clarify what does it mean to have a true and fair view for financial statements uh, is, for instance, would be, um, would be important. So I think we do see these, these various elements and how they should be played together. And I think the, the people that are thinking about this reform should have that system perspective rather than sort of just tweaking individual parts. Mm. Cacio, do you agree? Yeah, so so again, going back to your general question, is this just going to be a useless quick fix or just, you know, or is it is it going to be something meaningful? And I mean, in in legal scholarship, there's a lot of discussion about scandal driven regulation and whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. And obviously, regulation and lawmaking has to do with lobbying, no question about that. Um, and uh, still, um, there will be lobbyists. So we don't know what um, is actually going to see the the light of day um, in terms of what the German government and parliament is considering right now. But um, it's true that in that discussion about scandal-driven regulation, um, there's on on the not so good side, we see quick fixes, which won't really help. But on the good side, evidently, a couple of things have been discussed for a long, long time already. And so a scandal such as Wirecard might give them the political push they need to finally, you know, uh, get through um, and and supervise sort of um, all the the lobbying efforts going on. And that's true for auditor liability. And it's also true more to my own um, area of expertise to corporate boards and independence and competences, financial experts and stuff on corporate boards. So I could um, see really well that the discussion which has been going on for a long time uh, will now, um, you know, have a good reason to say we, we really need to change something in that area. And Jan, I did promise at the beginning that you would have the chance to grab all the glory. This is your moment. Uh, Thank you, Tim. So I will try to be brief, but crisp, right? So I think from our proposal, some are in a way incremental and some are pivotal. Which one will be realized is a is a matter of uh, expectation. But we push, of course, that also the pivotal changes can happen, although it requires more political power. So 
I would say everything we said on information flows is incremental. We want more of it, a better culture, a clearer understanding what the importance of short selling is, whistleblowing, make it better and so forth. And we have ideas, concrete ideas. The idea of concerning external audits and internal audits is also going much more in the direction of responsibility um, and both internally and externally higher liabilities and, and more accountability. This is also incremental in a good way. And I think the discussion is moving in this direction. What I think is pivotal is that giving the, informa the enforcement mandate fully to a clearly mandated institution, which is now not the case. So that will be enhance the basis for supervisory action in the future at the BaFin. And then second pivotal point, put this in a European architecture so that BaFin is only, let's say, the executing agent of a general will that we can see developing and commonly um, presented at the, at the European level. These two things, the last two things, I think are really would give a pivotal change to culture of capital markets in Europe. And uh, whether they happen or not, Uh, that is a good question. Uh, I see this is the, the, the big challenge and there is a lot of pressure is needed and we would like to contribute to that pressure. Well, we know for sure that this is not the last word in, uh, in this scandal. It was five years in the making and we think it's got a, a little while to go yet. So let's see what happens. But thank you very much to all of you for your uh, contribution today.